So now let's look at the next battle that sort of comes out of this. Again, back to Satan and all those parallels, because each one of us is really reliving it. We're, that's why this is a trial and why it's good evidence. Because each one of us, you know, and we don't really understand this, so it's, you know, um, how do you want to call it, objective. Because um, even when we do understand it, we don't understand it. Each one of us reliving it is reliving the situation Satan faced. And of course, the updated version, we're now reliving the higher problem of what Christ faced. And it's got many objectives. One of the biggest ones is to get to the oneness with him to see what it was like for him to have to live down here. And we're replaying it. Every single life is a replay of Christ. Every single life. Believer, unbeliever, atheist, agnostic, Christian, Jew, uh, call whatever divisions of humanity you want. Because he was human. That What was that? Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4 and Hebrews 2. Hebrews 4 has to do with, you know, he faced all the tests that we do, yet he was without sin. And it's not, it's not trying to be, it's not, God isn't berating you about the fact you sin. Humans do that. God isn't. God is trying to show how great it is not to have to sin. He's, his big point is, hi, there is an alternative that is far and away more enjoyable than sin. That's why I, God, don't sin. And I want you to have the same enjoyment I do. That's why Christ took on humanity, paid for sins, and we get his life. And that's the offer made to the angels, also, as it were, indirectly through us. Through us. Because when we're dead, we're higher than angels. That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. He was made higher than them at his death in his own nature. My pastor made a really big stink of that when he was he was going through um, Hebrews 1. I want to say it's in the first five verses or so. When he sat down, he was higher than the angels in his humanity. And what was that? 1 John 2, 26 through 3, 2. We end up having the same, you know, resurrection body he does. So we're higher than angels too. And of course, what was that? Paul Paul says somewhere that we're going to be judging angels. And then what was that? Second Corinthians five fourteen. Um, the triumphal procession. Where each you know, that you have to know what how do I explain that? There's a thing called Titus Arch, T-I-T-U-S, Arch, A-R-C-H. It's in Rome. you got to look at the picture of it. One Roman soldier is holding one slave, and they're walking to the Mamertine dungeon where the slaves are going to be executed. That was a triumphal procession. The same kind of verb is, and procession idea is used in 2 Corinthians 5.14. About how one of us believers is going to be holding on to a demon, walking them as it were to escort them into the lake of fire. Okay, or you know, to the off, sh the off point, you know, the end point, and then after that, they just go into the lake of fire. That's our job in the future. All of us, no matter what we are, we're church. We're higher than angels. Well, it sure don't feel like that down here. So that's that's kind of like the next battle because once you go through this excruciating differential of oh God's really high and I feel really low, but I got doctrine circulating in me, and you know you're basically flying on instruments. Okay, doctrine says this, but I feel this way. Doctrine's got to be right. My feelings got to be wrong. So you keep on going with the doctrine. Keep on going with the doctrine. Keep on going with the doctrine. And you can get into a sort of catechism about it. Into sort of a routine. So you kind of forget how hard it is and how crazy it is. 
And every once in a while, of course, you'll be reminded. But the other problem with it, the other problem with it, I'll cover in a second. So, to continue with that, because I sort of lost my train of thought, what is this next increment about? It's about the fact that once you come to grips with your being in this situation, and you sort of get into the groove of it, Yes, I'm a king. Yeah, I don't deserve it, of course. But I inherited that in Christ, which you really did. And now you're being trained to be a king just as much as if you were born, you know, in the house of Windsor, okay? Except it's even higher than that. Once you sort of accept that, even if you're uncomfortable with it, now you have to get into the actual work it's not your work, it's God's work, but you're still going through the motions. The actual work of ruling. It's a pistol. There's so many aspects to it. You never, ever, ever can rest. And yet, you're going to have to rest all the time, or you're going to, ah, rest and go carnal and just want to throw it all away that's what it's like to be a ruler you ha you're you're it's not like a nine to five job you are something you don't do something this is what i keep stressing all the pulpits are missing it you are the fruit not what you do a king or a queen or a prince is. What they do is beside the point. A king is a king. He's not doing kingship. He is a king. Different verb. Christ is Messiah. He doesn't do Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. The word Christ means anointed one. Hamashiach. In Hebrew, Christos in Greek means anointed one. He is something, not does something. I can't believe, I can't believe the pulpits are so wacko that they keep on stressing works. It's not about works. It's about becoming. It's about a change in your inner nature. Christ became the way, the truth, and the life. He was born a baby. He wasn't the way, the truth, and the life at birth. He had to learn it. Well, so do we. Holy, what was that? The Holy Spirit's our mentor, John 14. The very same mechanism by which Christ became the way, the truth, and the life. John, was that? John 4.24. We get the same mentor. The word mentor is used in the John 14 passage. Mentor was actually a name. A name of the guy who was the teacher of Telemachus. Telemachus was the son of Odysseus. The king, you know, we call him Odysseus, or however you pronounce it in English. Odysseus. Telemachus was his son. And when Odysseus went off, and did, you know, the Aeneid, or I think it was the Aeneid. Was it the Aeneid? Anyway, when he went off to conquer the world and gave up his daughter, Iphigenia, or whatever the hell it was, Telemachus was left behind. Mentor was the name of the guy teaching him. So, to use, you know, because it's written in Greek originally, John, of course, is talking and using mentor as the name so we can get the parallel. We're a royal family of God. Hello. The Holy Spirit is our mentor. And, of course, in English we have mentor for that reason, but we don't usually remember how come that word exists. Okay, so... This increment is about the ruling function. You are royal family. You don't do. You are. 
that's what makes it so painful. You wake up, you go to the bathroom, you pee, you eat, you pick your nose, and you're still royal family no matter what you do. So that's the problem of it. It's something you are. It's not like you can take it off. It's not like you can, it's not like a job that you get up in the morning, you clean yourself and blah, blah, blah. You go to work and from nine to five, you're, you're the job. But before nine and after five, you're you. There's no such separation for a king or a queen or a prince or a princess, or a celebrity. They don't get to separate it. That's one of the reasons why you don't want to be famous. Because once you are, you don't get to undo it. You don't ever get to be yourself again. I don't know why people want to be rich and famous. Because it's not something you, you can't turn back from it. You can't go back to the days before. And it's not until you have wealth and fame that you find yourself wishing you could go back to the days before. Wealth and fame are terrible things. They they have benefits. Everything has benefits. But boy, oh boy, you can't go back to the day when you could just walk out and buy a pack of gum and nobody would notice. And when you're poor and you're unknown and you're feeling inferior, you want to be rich and famous because you tell yourself that that will make you important and alleviate your sense of inferiority. Honey, it won't. If anything, your sense of inferiority will get worse. And you can't go back to the days when you were unimportant. And no amount of importance you get is ever going to satisfy the old sin nature. So whatever it is you got, you need more. Now couple all that problem with the fact that you have to punctiliarly rule on everything because you're always on divine television. Remember episode 11? Way back years ago, episode 11 in YouTube. You're on Divine Television, Episode 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 of this God Deed series dealt with being on Divine Television. You're on Divine Television. You think Satan's just going to sit there and go rah-rah you when you're busy proving him wrong? He can't take that. You think Donald Trump has an ego. You haven't even lived till you've seen Satan's. And I mean, he's not directly involved with you. But any insult to his own decisions, he's not going to tolerate that. You got your own guardian demon waiting to trip you up and probably succeeding every five seconds. So we can go, ha, 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 see, you're inferior to us. Yeah, of course you are. But it doesn't matter. See the point? You're on divine television. There are X number of angels and some of your dead relatives maybe. And, you know, demons watching. We know the angels are watching because Peter said so. Well, if the angels are watching, why wouldn't the dead humans be watching? If the angels are longing to look, as Peter put it, my pastor liked to translate that passage as craning their necks. Oh, Hello? If angels are learning from us, you don't think the dead humans are? Why would the angels be coming here in their off hours and looking at us? But why wouldn't God turn that into? Surely it can't be enjoyable unless God can turn it into something for learning Him. And if an angel's learning about Him, for me, honey, I'm glad to be used because I can't understand how anybody would want to watch me. And I'm sure you feel the same way. Okay, but we're royal family of God. And they're busy looking at us saying, Whoa, God's giving this really big job to these putzes? And then when we actually have a doctrinal thought or two, do you know how amazing that is? That's like the spiritual Olympics. Okay? 
You know, how amazed are we when somebody who's a child or retarded or disabled accomplishes something? Can you watch any of those videos on YouTube? with those disabled people who don't have arms or legs and they actually get into the Olympics in some way or they have some kind of testimony about how God saved them and look at how happy they are. I couldn't be happy like that and be disabled like them. Doesn't your heart just break for them? Don't you want to pray for them unendingly? Well, that's how the angels feel about us. To, uh, to them, we're handicapped. And they're totally amazed that we would be interested at all. What was that? What, what, what was that? I'm not sure who the writer was, but the, I, probably Peter. No. Christ. Somewhere in the Gospels, Christ says that every time somebody believes, the angels in heaven are, are you know, happy about it. Okay? He's not giving me exact phrasing, so you're going to have to, like, talk to him about where that is the angels in heaven are full of joy lost what was that the lost coin parable lost coin lost sheep it's around there if they're that overjoyed when one of us believes then they're learning something if they're that overjoyed when one of us believes then it's pleasant to them So we're already on divine television, clearly. And it stands to reason that if the angels are learning, who are higher than us, then surely, you know, some human who's off duty with whatever the humans do up there would be passing by and interested and maybe bring a couple of friends along and maybe it's some of your dead relatives, who knows. I mean, I don't know that that's true, but it, it's logical. If angels are learning from us, then surely humans would. Okay? Now, what's the point of that? You're on display. That's part of what rulership is. You're living in a glass house, and everybody's looking at you all the time. Look at the problems that the movie stars have. Somebody's constantly following them around. Look at the problem Princess Diana had. That's how she died. Paparazzi were following her. And the driver, I don't know if he was really drunk or not, but, you know, the point is, is that they had an accident in the Paris Tunnel because they were trying to get away from the, the reporters. That's how it is for you, too. That's how it is for me, too. What was that? The passage where Paul's talking about, it's in Second Corinthians... Three? Just after that. Just after that. Where he's talking about, oh, you know, it's actually in Second Corinthians 3 he starts out. But it's like it's he's doing it bullet points. Three, four, five. Oh, you know, you guys are in, yeah, because four, yeah. Three, four, five, they're bullet points. Three is on one point, four is on the next, and five is on the next. I'm laying on my back. I don't have the scripture in front of me. He's hitting me with the stuff. Okay, we, he's very sarcastic in that passage because the Corinthians were vaunting themselves. And he's saying, oh, oh no, that was 1 Corinthians 4, 7 and 8. Oh, you're already kings. We're nothing compared to you. We get, you know, shot down all day long. Go look it up. We're on divine television as a point. Now, that's part of being a ruler. You have to learn to accept the fact that you're always on display. And when you're rich and famous, you do learn to accept it. You hate it, or you don't hate it, but you're always on display. Some people eat it up. Some people are actually energized by constantly being in a crowd. There are two people that are currently running for president who are like that. Um, Jeb Bush, very different from the debates. It's like a wholly different person. He's not good in front of a camera when he's being interviewed, and he's not good in the debates, but he is just absolutely energetic and dynamic in a crowd. 
He really is. Okay? And because he's so smart and because he's so detailed, you know, he gets messed up in the details like I do. So, you know, he goes off in the toolies. Because he because he knows his material and he's trying to get it right. That's why I want to vote for him, of course. The other person who's energized in a crowd is uh, Donald Trump. And he also goes off in the toolies. But he never has a whole lot to say. You're always waiting for him. He says, oh, I'm going to fix this. Okay, you want to tell us how? And he never tells you how. Because his mind goes back to, oh, I'm so important, I'm so popular. He can't deal with it. He really loves being in a crowd. He loves being on stage. He's got the typical salesman personality. And if he ever had any substance, he'd be worth voting for. If he was consistent and had substance, you should vote for him. But he's neither of those two things. But the point is, he draws his energy from being on stage and in a crowd. So does Bush. I'm not so sure about the other guys. Okay? They seem to be... I mean, maybe they are. But just pretend for the sake of argument those two are true. That's the way you have to become. That's one of the hassles, the battle of integration and ruling. You have to learn to like being on stage. That's why I do these audios. I, I like it and I hate it. I like doing this and I hate doing this. I liked it a lot more at first. Because I just, you know, I, I'm understanding. I'm understanding the more I talk. I learn as I talk. That's why I'm talking. But God is also making me do, not making me, but he wants me to do this. I used to think it was just me. He wants me to do this so I can get practice. Because as a public person in the eternal state, I'm going to have to talk all the time. And there's a part of me that likes that. It's a part of me that likes being on stage. But the reason I like it now is not the same. Now I like it because I get to talk about him. I only like to talk if I can talk about him. Or talk about somebody else. I don't, I, the whole talking about the self thing. It's only good if it's a branch off to something else. Donald Trump, it's the opposite. He takes every topic and turns it into something about himself. Satan did the same thing. I'm not really trying to say that Donald Trump is Satan because he's not. He's, he's, he means well, okay? But the point is, is that you're going to go in one direction or the other, okay? Once you accept that you're a king, once you accept that you're on divine television, once you accept that you have to act as a ruler every day right now, over whatever you got, much or little, then you face a whole slew of issues that's a battle of integration. As a ruler, one of them is this business about always being in public. How do you come to grips with that? Okay, and the bottom line answer is you just presume it all the time, even when you're, you're alone. Just presume you're in public. Be the same in private as you are in public. Otherwise, it's just too much to, to have to adjust to. You can't you can't go back and forth like inside outside. You got to be the same person all the time, which means that when you're in public, you sort of discount the fact that it's public, and when you're in private, you discount the fact that it's private. You're you. You're living before God. That's it. Everything else just doesn't matter. Do everything is under the Lord. You've heard that. Well, here's an angle for it. If it's always under God, private or public, then it you, you learn how to not have it matter that it's private and not have it matter that it's public. And you don't have to adjust. Okay? Now, in public, with people face-to-face, -face, I don't talk like this. With people in public... I basically don't talk. On the internet, yeah, because it's impersonal. You can afford to be more blunt. But when you got bodies to bodies, you can't afford to be blunt. It hurts too much. 
It hurts them. That's a, a rulership decision. I don't want to hurt you. When you're talking in a comment and I'm talking in a comment, we're not, it's not personal. We're talking about ideas. And so we can be nasty or nice, it doesn't matter. It's not personal. You can call me names, I can call you names. It's not personal. We're talking about the ideas. If you're calling me names, you're not really calling me names. You're calling my ideas bad. And I might be calling your ideas bad. Okay, but they're ideas. They don't really belong to you. And they don't really belong to me. And your character is not your ideas. So if your idea is bad, it's the idea that's bad, not you. If my idea is bad, it's the idea that's bad, not me. See the difference? But when you're next to another body and talking, that's not so easy to do. The body somehow makes it more personal. So you have to, like, be quieter and, you know, stand off and stuff like that. That's a rulership decision. When you're a king of your kingdom, when you're the superior one, and inferior ones are in bodily contact or in your body periphery, you got to back off. you got to soften. And that's a rulership issue. Well, it's a pistol to do that. But you're in body periphery with, you know, some guy in a car. You're on the highway and he's on the highway and he's right next to you and he's about to crash into you. Everything in your body is going to want you to, you know, flip him off or something. And you don't dare do that. First of all, it's a sin. And secondly, he might just actually hit you out of road rage. So you got to tame it. That's a rulership decision. And you got to make it right then. It's like being in combat. Rulership is a type of combat. That's why I call it battle. Okay, so that's one of the battles. Is bodily presence versus impersonal? How do you know the difference? How do you know when to do what? But here's the bigger one. And kind of the point of this whole audio. No matter what decision you make, you lose. That's what prompted this audio to start with. He hit me with that, which is why I turned on the recorder. Think about that. No matter what decision you make, you lose. It's not even possible to be a ruler without that being true. Even God. Whatever decision you make, you lose. There's always a loss. When you decide something, you're saying yes to A and no to its antithesis. So you're losing the antithesis. You're cutting it off. If you have to choose between going to the bathroom and eating in that same moment, you're going to make a choice between one and the other. And the other loses. Do you eat or pee? If you eat, then pee loses. If you pee, then eat loses. And you say, well, but I can eat later, or I could pee later, yeah. But it it loses in that instant. Now that's a simple way of putting it, but it gets much more complex. You're at the office. Your boss really needs a report tomorrow at 7. And while you're an early riser, you can't really predict the traffic. And your spouse wants you home for dinner. And you didn't know that this report was going to have to be due. So do you blow it off and go home and hope you'll be there at the office in time tomorrow? Or do you stay and get it done tonight so you'll be sure it will be done? 
and blow off your spouse. That's not so easy. But even that example is easier than the real kind of issues that you have to face as a ruler. Do you go to war or not? Do you adopt this economic policy or some other one? Do you pay this bill or another one? When you can't do both. In any sequence. And when you go to war, somebody's going to die. When you go to war, money's going to get spent. When you go to war, equipment and all kinds of expense are going to occur that your people are going to have to pay for it later. And you don't even know if you're going to win. This is the problem America has. It's not willing to fight. We have been presented for 50 years now with the disgusting, bilious, satanic Palestinians and we will not fight. And thank God for George W. Bush. He finally said, end. We're going in. We're going to stay in the Middle East. That's the only way to resolve this. Yeah, hello, after 50 years of being proven that, hello, Russia isn't going to do it. Russia just wants the Arabs around. Russia supports the Arabs. They supported all those horrible regimes. We ended up, really, I'm not so sure you could argue how much we needed them, but we ended up doing it also because it's just like a stalemate between Russia and us. You know, during the Cold War years. And then after that, we needed the oil. And during that time, we really, we really didn't need the oil. We told ourselves we did. It's a long story there. But, hello. All the stuff that's happening to us now. If we had gone in there right after World War II and parked ourselves in the Middle East like we should have done, the problems we got today wouldn't be there. And Bush, to his credit, and I don't know if it was him or his advisors, finally said, you know what, this problem is not going to go away. If we don't park ourselves there in Afghanistan and Iraq, it ain't going to happen. We got to stay parked there. Because Russia, you can't trust. And that's what he said. We're going to take the war to the enemy. And that's where it should have stayed. We should never have pulled our troops out. That's a rulership decision. That's a decision you're going to find yourself making in really pretty much the same terms. You know, Christ said you can't you you can't you know God and Mammon don't fit together. Mammon is a I think it's Aramaic word for you know playing along to get along in the world. You have to choose between Christ and the world, and it's not like your typical apostate Christian thinks. They think being worldly means that you drink and you dance and you go with the people who like that kind of stuff. No, that's not worldliness. Worldliness is being like them. Oh, we're going to save the world. Oh, we're going to convert the world. Oh, we're going to make the world ready for Christ. Oh, we're going to do some soul winning. That's worldliness. You have to agree. You have to rule in your mind. You know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sit and study line on line, precept on precept. Like Jesus Christ did. Because he didn't do any of those things Christians do. There's not a single thing that Christians do today that Christ did. Not a thing. They say, well, but Christ converted people. No, he didn't. Go read your Bible. He walked around on a circuit announcing himself as Messiah. And people came up and asked him questions. And he answered them. He didn't knock on doors. He didn't run revival meetings. He didn't go collect for the poor. In fact, he chided them for doing that. The poor you will have with you always. Go read what he did. He explained Bible to people who came to see him. 
and he went on a circus, it would be more convenient. But he would appear in a town, they would come to him. He'd appear in the next town, they would come to him. And it was a predictable circuit that he went on. He didn't ask, he didn't do any altar calls. In fact, if anything, it was, you know, John the Baptist who did the altar calls. Christ went to him. And John said, well, I shouldn't be baptizing you. And what did Christ say to him? We must fulfill all righteousness. In other words, everything Jesus Christ did, and of course, you know, royalty is what you are, not what you do. But if we're going to talk about deeds, everything he did, no Christian does. Or very few. What did he do? You will, learn, you will not live on bread only, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. Okay, so how come they aren't doing that? So if you want to be Christ-like, do what Christ did. What would Jesus do? What word Jesus did? Well, Christians aren't doing words, they're doing deeds. That's a rulership decision. You have to decide. Okay, I'm not going to be like those Christians. I'm going to walk away like Jesus did, and I'm going to do what word Jesus did. Okay, but you can't do a word until you learn the word. That's the point that James is making in James 2. Otherwise, you're looking at your face in the mirror, mirror of the word of God, and you walk away and you forget about it. That's what they do every Sunday. That's a rulership decision. So now you're separating yourself from the world of Christians, separating yourself from the works of Christians, in order to do what Jesus did. And it hurts. And that's a daily decision, a daily test, a daily problem you face every day. A lot of times when I talk in these audios and the stuff that I've been, I'm thinking, gee, you know, Dad, am I being too worldly? Am I really supposed to do this? And the only justification is, and this is the kind of example of rulership. What's good about it? What's right about it? What's wrong about it? It's a constant juridical question. Okay, Dad, I'm going to eat breakfast. What should I eat for breakfast? And the answer invariably is, I'm supposed to, you know, like, rehearse. What's right? What's wrong? What's the right decision? What's the wrong decision? Even about eating breakfast. Not because it's about the breakfast. It's about the decision making. That's very tiring. I'm exhausted. Rulership is exhausting. Because everything... What was that? Uh, my pastor's expression. He was just throwing that at me. A right thing has to be done for a right reason and in a right way and at the right time. Well, then that means you have to slow down. You can't just... Until you've done it over and over and over again for the same right reason and at the right time and in the right way. Until you've done it that many times. You have to slow down. Okay, I don't know. You know, what do I eat for breakfast? Well, where's the most nutrition for the least calories? You know, if calories is a problem. Or what's the most nutrition for the most calories? If calories are an opposite kind of problem. Well, that means you have to describe the problem, you have to know the problem, you have to think about this and that and the other thing, and what am I going to eat later, and should I eat this now in light of what I'm going to eat later, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm dead now, I'm so tired. Just to eat breakfast? People don't go through that. Okay, but you better, because hello, do you write an email? Do you get involved in the comments? That's one of my big problems. So I just instinctively, psh, I'm there, Jack, with the comments. Well, maybe I shouldn't be. It's a sequence issue. Is God first in your mind when you have to make a decision? And then from God, you go to God. Okay, Dad, what do I decide? And then his answer is going to be invariably, you know, you have to sort of sort it out. Practice. 
Here's what's right about the decision. Here's what's wrong. Just as if somebody came up to you and said, okay, um, ruler, king, what do we do about this problem? Like, we're going to the United States government, and we want to elect somebody as a president. And once he's president, he has to decide on everything. You know how exhausting that is. Okay, well, honey, that's your job. You're more than president. You're royal family. You gotta decide on everything. What do I eat for breakfast? What do I wear? How do I respond to somebody who calls me? What do I say in the comments? How do how do I dress in front of a group? What kind of job should I have? Where should I live? What kind of dwelling should I have? What kind of car should I buy? What do I need at the grocery store? We do a lot of those things without thinking, but it's not supposed to be without thinking. Because rulership means you always are supposed to try to take all the facts and circumstances in of the account in order to make a royal decision. See, if you're just you, see, you're the fruit, not what you do. Okay, well, if that weren't true, then if what you did mattered, well, you know, your off hours, it doesn't matter what you decide. Whatever you want. But when you're royal, it can never be like that. If you're royal, every decision you make 24-7 is being made by a royal person. So it has a royal impact, a royal effect, with royal training. And that's how royals are trained. Even in this world, from the minute they're born. They are never allowed to forget who they are. It's who they are. And that determines what they do. Your royal family, that determines what you do. And God help you if you forget it. Now, as I was saying earlier, no matter what decision you make, you lose. That's a hard thing to live with. I mean, you know, I'm no fan of Obama, okay, but, you know, he's the latest president. I'm sure he didn't feel good at all about having to send soldiers in harm's way. I know GW didn't feel good about it. How can you? There, you're ordering soldiers. To go die, possibly, on your behalf in some foreign land you don't go to. Their blood, their hard work, their sweat. Not yours. I mean, we all, all of us who are Christians anyway, are kind of keenly aware, you know, Christ died for me. Granted, you know, a lot of times we're so used to saying it that we don't think about it. But there are times when you, it really comes clear. He died for me. Okay, your president, your ruler, they're going to die for you. And frankly, and this is something they don't talk enough about. We go through all this stuff down here. Learning how to train. Bad or well. The angels are looking at us and saying... Wow, these people are suffering for Christ. And we are. Peter, what was that? You just brought that up. Peter talks about that. If you suffer for Christ, do it the right way. Where was that? It's in 1 Peter. Somewhere, if you suffer for Christ, serve unto your masters. It's it's in the early part of First Peter. Is that Epicorgeo? Oh, is that where that is? It's somewhere in there. If you're suffering for Christ, well, we all really are. We don't think of it that way. Some of us try to think of it that way to feel better about ourselves, but technically speaking, we are the whole human race is. The believer and the unbeliever alike. 
because the only reason we're here is because he did. If he didn't suffer and pay for sins, we wouldn't be born. So, he suffered, so now we suffer, and it isn't about the suffering. It's about empathy. When you suffer, you gain empathy. That's the goal of it. He suffered for us, and we get to suffer for him. And of course, if you don't believe in him, that's not that's not good news. Okay, but it's just like the Exodus, and that was the method and the message of the Exodus and why God created the Seder. You know why you had to do the memorial? Is that all of the firstborn in Egypt, they weren't believers necessarily. They probably weren't, because, you know, if you were a believer, then you were exempt. The firstborn in Egypt, they died. And the idea in the memorial for the Exodus, in part, is to remember, look, all these unbelievers died for you. That's what Moses is saying in, what was it, Deuteronomy 6 and 30. You know, you're entering into a land, and you're taking over everybody else who's in it. And he's, you know, making parallel with the exodus from Egypt, okay? You're replacing somebody. They're going to suffer because you're there. Don't get fat-headed about that. In other words, God's honoring those who rejected him. Rejected him in Egypt rejecting him in the land because it was a bunch of criminals that Israel was sent to clean out. People who believed in rape and pillage and murder and especially having sex while your own kids get burnt on an altar to Molech or Chemosh or Baal, they call them by different names. That's what Israel was sent in to replace. You know, later on they call him Mohammed. In those days, they were just the Greeks. They weren't Arabs. But the Arabs and the Greeks intermingled. And later on, you know, then you get Mohammed and all of his garbage. That's what they did. But even as bad as they were, they're going to die. The job of Israel was to kill them. The firstborn of Egypt had to die before Pharaoh would let the people go. And so as a memorial ever after, when you go through the Seder, that's what you were supposed to remember. That's why God instituted it in Exodus 12. And of course it forced, you know, presaged the coming of Messiah who would die. Per John 19 that the scholars are forgetting to look at. He died on what should have been Passover. But they didn't intercalate. So John skips four days, and then he skips another four days. So you go from four, five days before Passover, and then Passover, and then five days after. Except that the Passover he's talking about was the official one, because he didn't intercalate. And then Christ dies on the fifth day, which is four days between, on the real Passover, because he didn't intercalate. They were using 360 days. They should have been using 365. They didn't intercalate. That's John's big point in John 18. What was it? 39 or something. And then he, he plays on it all throughout John 19. Why did the scholars miss that? See, this is the kind of stuff a ruler, a ruler has to know facts. A ruler has to have be information dense. And constantly be making decisions as a result. And constantly has to keep in mind that no matter what decision he makes, something suffers. Israel goes into the land. The world needed that to happen. Israel was supposed to be the example of what you know, faith in God was supposed to be, what freedom was supposed to be, because all the other nations of the world, they weren't getting it. They had been given a long time to figure it out. It's not like God only visited, a, you know, Abraham. Everybody else could have known. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 1 and 2. Everybody else could have known. They said no. 
So then God has to bring out a people. Set them up as an example. And then everybody else can vote with their feet to go there if they're interested. But of course they weren't. So there's a loss in there. There's a loss of the people that God had replaced. The ones in the land. The criminals. But they still got replaced. That's a loss. There was a loss to even get out. Of, up to the firstborn in Egypt. Because that was the cost of getting them out of the land. Pharaoh would not let the people go. And God defers to authority. He gives you enough time to hang yourself. And of course during that period of time. A lot of the Egyptians converted. That's why you know there were so many leaving Egypt. Okay but that's a cost. It depopulated Egypt. I don't know how, how familiar you are with this, the story. But Amenhotep II only had nine campaigns. Which means he only had nine years of rule. And that means he was the pharaoh that went into the Yam Suf. The Reed Sea. Which the Greeks would later rename the Red Sea. For Pharaoh and all the troops drowning in it. The Jews didn't name it that. Yam Suf means Reed Sea. That's in the Bible. Red Sea is in Herodotus. So by then the name had changed. Somewhere between 1440, 1400 when Moses writes, and Herodotus, which was what, 500 B.C., 700 B.C., 300 B.C., I don't remember. I think it's probably 300 or 400 B.C. So, there was a cost. There was the loss of the unbelievers. There was the loss of Egypt. There was the loss of Pharaoh and his troops. And after Pharaoh and his troops went into the sea, and with so many Egyptians leaving too, Egypt was pretty much depopulated. And as a result, the guy who came next, Tutmosis the Fourth, Fourth, he had a dream. His dream was that the Egyptian, you know, the Sphinx, promised him that he would be the next ruler. Well, if the Sphinx is promising him that he's going to be the next ruler, then he wasn't the first ruler. Yeah, because Amenhotep's first son was one of the first born in Egypt who died. And Amenhotep II is dead, and his son is dead, so Tutmosis the fourth, guess what? Is the next son. And of course... The dream that the Sphinx would make him be the ruler, of course, you know, lends divine sanction. Okay, but you know what Tutmosis IV had to do? He had to make a diplomatic marriage with the Mitanni, which means he had no troops. The Mitanni were way up north, if memory serves, around where the Golan Heights are, I think. You know, verify that. It was definitely the Mitanni. He had to make a diplomatic marriage with the Matani. And where is Brain out getting all that stuff? Encyclopedia Britannica, 1985. I have them now. I used, you know, I, I, I had the hardback. I lost the hardback for a while and I just bought them back. 1985, Encyclopedia Britannica. Under the entry for Tutmos IV. And under the entry for Amenhotep II. Does Encyclopedia Britannica know that it was he was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? No, they don't know that. The timing is the same. But you can find out about the nine campaigns in the entry about Amenhotep II, and you can find out about the dream in the entry about um, Tutmos IV in the the Macropedia. Mac, yeah, Macropedia. 
That's where it is, and I can get the copy if you need it. Now, what's the point of that? Loss. God decided. See, Christ is going to pay for everybody. This is what the Calvinists don't understand. Their number one reason why they think that Christ only died for the elect is they think that if he died for those not elect, that somehow there's a loss. Yeah, there is. God didn't get the loss. God didn't lose. Christ paid for all sin. God is due payment for all sin. Is everybody saved? No. Why? Because not everybody believes in Christ. It's free will. Sorry, Calvinist, you don't understand the Bible. But what about all those humans who are in hell? That's a loss. Yes, it is. And it can always be reversed because Christ paid for everybody. So all those unsaved people in hell right now, they don't have to stay there. And you know that from the last half of Luke 16. Because in that day, Christ is talking to people. He's talking about a real live guy that's having a real live conversation with Abraham. He can see Abraham and Lazarus at a distance. And he's complaining, trying to, you know, make Lazarus feel bad and trying to make Abraham feel bad. Oh, I'm, I'm suffering so much. Just have Lazarus come and give me a drop of water. Honey, if you can see Abraham and Lazarus having a good time, why don't you do what Abraham did in Genesis fifteen six? Believe in Jesus Christ like Abraham did. That's what Christ was talking about at the end of John 8. Oh. Okay, so, guess what? Christ went down to hell. You know, victorious proclamation. I think that's in, that's also in Peter. He went to the English, what was that? He, he he preached to the spirits in prison. That's King James. That's the verse, wherever that is, it's in Peter. So he went down there. They all saw him. Hi, I went to the cross, finished the cross, I won. So why didn't they believe then? Loss. As a ruler, every day, every decision you make, you're going to suffer a loss. Do I go with these Christians, or do I go study the Bible? Do I watch television, or do I study Bible? Do I cook, or go to the bathroom? Whatever decision you make, somebody loses. The hardest thing about ruling is to recognize all the time there's a loss no matter what decision you make, and it hurts. I'm not passing that test. Well, he's giving a lot of time for the, to try, but it's really hard for me to come to grips with the fact of the loss. No matter what I do, no matter how many audios I make, no matter how many videos I do, they're never going to get it. I can't pour out what I know and can prove in Scripture if I talk from now until the end of time. And no matter what I could pour out, nobody's going to hear it. When I say nobody, I don't mean literally 100% nobody. Because you're hearing it. But if it works, God makes it work. But even so, I get the privilege of being able to pour it out. Okay? Which is practice for pouring it out once I'm dead. Which is practice for you too. Even so, the loss is forever. The poor you will always have with you. Loss. It's really hard to come to grips with that. When I look at the news and I see all this baloney 
going on between Trump and Cruz and everybody else. And everybody's ignoring the fact that both of them are putzes. And all they do is go back and forth about how bad each other is. And nobody's talking about the issues we face. Trump never talks about solutions. He always says, I'm good. Trust me, I can fix it. But he never tells you how. So you can't make a valid decision. When you go to buy a computer, you have to know what's in the computer to decide whether you're going to buy it. When you hear a candidate, you have to know what's inside the candidate to know if you're going to vote for him. Somebody's saying, oh, I'm good. Well, okay, prove it. Or at least give me something to tell me why you say you're good. But they don't. And yeah, okay, they got their positions and their websites. But those things don't tell you much either. Okay? So there's a loss. There's a huge loss. Christian, I, what was that? You just, he, he, he usurped it. What was it? Hosea 4, 6, you got to read that whole section. My people perish for lack of truth knowledge, the at. It's translated just knowledge, but the at means truth knowledge, a.k.a. Bible doctrine. My people perish for lack of doctrine. And then the rest of the chapter goes on to say, so I'm going to remove you. I'm going to take you out. Meaning, the United States is so apostate now between these two dominionist candidates Trump and Cruz Cruz who's a known dominionist he's an avowed dominionist his his dad is a really apostate disgusting man who's all over YouTube Rafael Cruz go listen to his bilious sermons he's not even really a pastor he's a liar he calls himself a pastor but he doesn't have any sheep. So you're not a pastor. He's not trained as a pastor. Either. So he's self-appointed. Okay, but a pastor is God appointed. And then you train. That's Cruz. Trump, he's the tool. He says he's not bought by anybody. Honey, he's just been bought. He's been bought by the Dominionists at Liberty University, Oral Roberts, the whole evangelical movement is shifting over to him and away from Cruz. Because the evangelicals only want political power. God means nothing to them. At all. Period. Pro-lifers, they gave everything to Caesar. They want them, they're marching on Washington. March for life. No, it's March for Satan. You want to talk about loss? My country is perishing for lack of truth knowledge about God. And I have to sit here and watch them. And so do you. It's like watching Dresden burn during World War II. Dresden was one of the cities that we Americans had to bomb. That's loss. Hiroshima, Nagasaki. We had to burn those people. I mean, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were even worse. But Dresden, they just it entirely bombed out. The, the suffering. And you can't do anything about it. It's like standing outside at a distance from the Hindenburg or one of those planes and everybody's trapped inside and it's burning so you can't go close. And you can't put out the fire and all you can do is hear them scream. That's all you can do is hear them scream. What do you think they're doing in hell right now? God is hearing that all the time. In fact, that's the reason why a lot of apostate Christians try to claim that there is no hell. Because they can't fathom. How can God stand it? See, the hardest thing about rulership is the loss. No matter what decision you make, you lose. God is picking you and me, but not them. 
And of course the answer is God will pick whosoever believes he'll save. But not everybody believes. And a lot of Christians, they can't handle it. And you can understand why. Satan, the same problem. Satan thinks he's saving God from himself. He thinks that God somehow got all confused. And, you know, Satan is, is pretty much like Obama. Except he's smart. Obama's smart and dumb all at the same time. Satan thinks that his plan works better for man than God's. God is all about truth be free. Satan's plan is trim it, trim it, trim it, trim it to make man feel good about himself. God's answer to Satan is, well, where do you stop? You want to trim freedom? Okay, where do you stop? And at what point does that freedom become a sham? It's kind of like affirmative action. I mean, I don't know if you know too much about it. I was alive when that thing got started. You had affirmative action for blacks, Hispanics, and women. And I, as soon as I heard about that, I thought, you know what? I don't want... If someone's going to hire me only because I'm female, I'm not taking the job. I don't need you to help... You know, I don't need your pity because I'm female. That's really what it meant. And a lot of blacks resented it too. And a lot of blacks took advantage of it. You know, free lunch. But, you know, it's it's like the ultimate putting you down. Hi, the only reason you get these goodies is because you're something else. It's kind of like a woman marrying a guy for his money. Which means she doesn't value him. She values what he owns. So he doesn't mean anything to her. And how happy is he going to be? So what kind of freedom is it? You trim and trim and trim and trim and trim. Okay? We're going to make it so you can't sin. We're going to make it so you can't live an immoral life. That's what the Christian right is all about. They think they'll bring Christ back that way. No, they'll bring Satan what kind of life is it? This is what the books 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World was about. Especially Brave New World. Oh, I'm a gamma. And all the things I can do are of is a gamma. And a gamma is happy for being a gamma. Yeah, and all you are is like a little robot. What kind of happiness is that? That's what Satan's plan means. Stepford wives. Well, Okay. You're not hurting the way we hurt it for free. But maybe it's better to hurt and be free. God says yes. But that's a loss. That's a loss you're willing to undergo in order to have the freedom. That's the big battle of every day. The big battle of integration. Do you integrate with freedom? Or do you integrate with slavery? If you're going to integrate, either way, you're going to lose, aren't you? If you integrate with slavery, you're losing freedom. If you integrate with freedom, well, you are losing slavery, and that's good. But look at how much time you have to spend fighting in order to stay free. And that's my big failing. I, like Satan, I, I'm sort of thinking, I don't want to fight that hard to be free. See why that's wrong? So that's a big issue you face as a ruler. Just like Satan. Loss. No matter what decision you make, you lose. You're either fighting to get free, so you lose because you have to fight. Or you stop fighting in order to stop fighting. But then you lose freedom. And the hardest part of this is not so much your own loss of your own self or your time, 
but seeing it happen to others and you can't do a thing about it. I can't do a thing to stop the loss of my people. My people perish for lack of doctrine, Hosea 4, 6. They're going to inherit the, the whirlwind. I think that's Hosea 6, 7. Definitely Galatians 6, 7. I think it's Galatians 6, 7. God is not mocked. That's the passage. No matter what I do, my fellow Christians, they're like lemmings. They're going off over the cliff into politics. Revelation 17, playing live on your TV every time you turn it on in 2016. That's Revelation 17, politicized Christianity. And they can't tell? Who doesn't know the whore of Babylon? So what, what's so hard for them not to understand? What's a whore? Somebody who prostitutes herself. Actually, whore is worse than prostitute. Prostitutes get paid. Whores give it away for free. Babylon. What was Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. What was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom? Unity of church and state. What did he do? Daniel 2. He built a freaking statue. Daniel 2 or Daniel 5? Man of time. I think it's Daniel 2. Daniel gave him the dream thing. You know, he had the dream thing. Daniel did the man of time. And I maybe it was Daniel 5. He built he built a ninety foot gold statue and wanted everybody to bow before it because he didn't like the idea that his gold kingdom the head would ever go away. So he made a whole man instead of just the head. He went wacko after Daniel gave him that interpretation. That was Babylon, and even after he died, it was Babylon. You know, because his son's, actually his grandson. And that's why Cyrus came in, the whole story, many, many, Teglu, Farsa, and Daniel, what was it, six? Might have been seven or eight. No, six, I think. Okay? There you go. Satan wants the unity of church and state. God doesn't. Spirit is spirit, life, you know, secular is secular. That's always been the story. The Christians are politicizing it, and you can't stop them. Revelation 17, the horror of Babylon, playing live on TV every day now. Can't stop them. That's loss. All that loss. And it goes on forever, because when we're dead... All those same people, assuming they're saved, are going to be in heaven. And they never learned him. And now they're going to try and catch up. So it will be a constant, you know, wide gap between the king and the kingdom. The loss continues forever. And then, of course, you got hell continuing forever. That's the hardship of the kingship. Whatever decision you make is loss. So starting like right away. Now. How do you live with that? Whatever decision you make. You're the king. You are losing something. Pick your loss. That's the essence of kingship. 